No jumper. Coolest podcast in the world. Okay, so your weed regimen is that you hit the pen all day and then you sort of bust out into we, into flower guy after your sets, that kind of thing? Yep. After I do a stand-up show, it's party on, like mm. like a, like Wayne and Garth. Do you, do you get the adrenaline rush when you do the set to the point where you're, you're like basically just a rock star now where you need to find something and it's not going to be, you know, OxyCon, it's going to be Kush? You're 100% right. <laughs> That's it. You got to chase that with something. Right. I can't even imagine what it's like for those rock stars, especially they have to do like the same songs a lot. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. And I'm sure it's fun giving that crowd what they want when they want that song. Mm. And maybe you're maybe you got to close with it for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? Whereas at least stand up comedians, we get to, you know, we get to rotate material mm. and come up with new stuff. Once we make an album or a special, it's like. You can't do that again. I was just hearing you have that conversation with Snoop, I think, where, you know, they're, they're coming out and doing the this, this same songs every night, whereas with you, you got to kind of shock and, and exhilarate yourself. I may have talked about this with Snoop. I cannot remember a single thing about that fried. interview. You, you, Dude. He, he asked you a question and you completely didn't know what question he asked you and just started talking about how high you were. I, uh, oh, yeah. I was out of it, man. <laughs> that guy, that, that, it's just unreal. I'm afraid to go back and watch that video. I literally mm. don't remember anything other than like after it it was like suffering a brain injury mm, i have turned down weed from all kinds of big rappers when i'm doing this because a lot of times it's like 11 in the morning and i just don't feel like facing a blunt and having the next couple hours of my day like irreputably damaged yeah i mean, I mean the age is just hitting me i'm 35 now Same. and i already have to take a nap if i have like any anything with beef in it or steak or already really? or if i have french fries for lunch i already have to have a nap see i could eat steak every meal of the day but one, if i really overload on carbs i can feel the effect on my body for sure yeah yeah well i still do it i eat steak every day <laughs> yeah. and i still take a nap I just woke up from a nap right now. I live right around the corner from here. Oh, right. I was, I was, I was out like a light. I figured you'd be a valley boy. No, you like to stay close to the shit. Heck yeah, right in it, man. <laughs> right in the mix, right around here. How about you? Are you over there? I'm like right over by the Grove, but yep. actually, we just bought a house in the valley, so we built a move. Nice, yeah, that's where you buy houses at. But yeah, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm right by you. Yeah, I, I bet we live super close to one another. Probably we got a sleepover or something. Heck shit. yeah, let's fucking do it. <laughs> just dude. sleep on my couch. Let's have uh, those tin cans with like a string. So you'd be like, hey, Adam, what are you doing? It's weird to think about when you're a kid that that's an actual <laughs> exhilarating thing that you look forward to is literally just your friends sleeping on a sleeping bag on the floor in your room. Yeah. So much fun, man. Yeah. Those were the days. I was just telling someone about my friend Billy Poole. I realize, I'm only realizing now at my ripe age how hilarious my childhood was. Like my, I had a buddy named Billy Poole that would get in trouble for everything. Mm-hmm. And we had a sleepover at his house one night. I'm just going to tell you this story. No, I'm super down for it. And whatever. Billy would get caught doing everything, right? So, like, if everyone threw a paper ball at the teacher. He was the one the, going Exactly. Down. I feel like 100. I was that kid. Yep. And Billy Poole got in trouble for everything. And he had an angry dad, right? One of those tough Irish, Youngstown, Ohio, fucking tough, tough, tough Irish dads. Okay. And... Uh, so one night we went around, we, we always fucked with this one house, right? We'd light bags of poop on fire and ring the doorbell and go across the street in the bushes and watch, see what happened. And one night, I don't know what Billy was thinking, but he's, we'd probably been drinking, you know, we would do that shit where you mix all the different liquors together oh, in a man. bottle and just run around and get wasted. Oof. Anyway, so I can't remember how or why, but he ended up like punching like the screen door. Is that your car alarm? No. Okay. I don't think. I, I hope. I, I hope know. that's not what my alarm sounds of all like. All the cars that are in the radius are here. I don't know why I would assume it was yours, except yours is the last car I looked at. Yeah. Yeah. If that's what my car alarm sounds like, I'm I'm returning it and getting a new car. <laughs> new car. If for they sure. put a, a cord alarm on that Corvette, I'm gonna be so mad. I need, I need my alarm Wee. to sound expensive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, so I remember Billy one cool. night. Yeah, Billy for some reason like punched the house for some reason. You know, that's such a teenage thing. Exactly. To do. <laughs> I was it was just, just so mad. I'm punching this wood. <laughs> so dumb. Exactly. But that was Billy. Right. And we end up going back to his place. We run back. Right. And we like crawled under, you know, the whole we're all sleeping in the living room area. So there's like couches. And there's like four of us. And we all crawl under blankets and shit. And uh, all of a sudden we hear a knock on the door and knock again we're right there in the living room but we're pretending like we're out like a light because we're not going to answer the door and of course you you hear billy's angry dad wake up like god damn it what's going on down there and he comes down answers the door and we're pretending to be asleep but 
uh, he, the guy goes, "Hey, I'm a police officer. We have uh, we we have reason to believe that some uh, somebody here just vandalized a house." <laughs> and uh, I always remember Billy's dad going, "Well, I know it couldn't have been any of these guys at this sleepover because they know I'd fucking kill them." <laughs> And uh, we're still just fake sleeping, pretending like we're in some type of deep coma because this is literally happening in the same room that we're in. And he goes, what makes you think that it's any of these kids from this house, officer? And the That's cop- such a dead giveaway that you're yeah. still just lying, pretending <laughs> right. to be sleeping. Right, exactly. <laughs> and uh, the cop goes, because we followed a little uh, trail of blood all the way back to here. There's literally driplets of blood. It turns out Billy didn't realize, but he had cut his hand. Oh, my God. And the cops literally followed this, like, comedic trail of breadcrumbs from where he punched on that house right. around the block to back straight to up his driveway. And so we all got in big trouble for that one. We that were sucks. caught literally red-handed. That's, like, what your childhood is like, though, is being really, really bad at committing crimes yep. and just doing them anyway because you're not smart enough to know about all the obvious ways that adults have created to catch you doing these crimes. It's unbelievable. When I think about it in my career or my childhood shoplifting career, almost none of the things that I was doing at that time that I thought I was such a fucking genius doing are things that would really work in today's world of mass surveillance. Yeah. You know? Yeah. One time I was working at a gas station. I went off on this. Somehow I, I grabbed a lottery ticket and I'm like, <laughs> and I just scratched it off and I lost. And then I'm like, well, you know what? This is like, I'm like 16 at right. the time. And I'm like, you know what? If I get another one, then that one, the odds are now, are now in the favor that that's going to be a winner. <laughs> Cut to me <laughs> getting like $80 later. in debt from this thing that now I now owe to the lottery ticket thing because I'm just bored at a gas station scratching off lottery tickets. Uh-huh. So I won one for $5, but now I'm 20 behind. Right. Right. So now I'm like, now I have to win more. So dumb. That was one of my best uh, things I ever pulled off when I was working at the grocery store is that I would go to talk to the girl who worked at this like window where you could get lottery tickets and cigarettes and stuff. I don't think they were allowed to sell it like from the regular register. And I would talk to her. And then when she wasn't looking, I would reach over and I'd grab a bunch of the $5 cards and shove them in my pocket. And like, I felt like a fucking genius when I would inevitably get like a $20 winner and cash that in. I felt like I had just hit the lick of the century. Heck yeah. I mean, that is a pretty good, I mean, I would do that today if I knew about that con if i knew where i could trick the girl hey what's that over there <laughs> look <laughs> i'll take some free lottery tickets you, you know your burning poop story is like there's there was only one celebrity who lived in the town that i grew up in triple h whoa and we did that a few times that we would go and drop but I don't, he was like never there if you're a wrestler you're like never home yeah but we would hear that he lived in this house so we would go once in a while and like leave poop on the on the steps or Whatever, and like him and China allegedly lived in this house some part of the year, but probably not that much. Whoa, that's so cool! Triple H was that in Connecticut? Nashua, New Hampshire. Oh, okay. Yeah. Damn, that's cool, man. That is not a guy that I would burn poop on his stoop, though. We were I such mean, pussies, though. We knew, we knew that there was no way he was going to be home. I'm right. not sure, like, if we even knew if we had the right house or not. You know. <laughs> no, I have this uh, traumatic story too of like being outsmarted by the cops when I was like. I was like 17, maybe 16, and me and my friends were out riding bikes. And there's like a light, like a, a fixture, like light thing outside of this corporate office. And we're riding this handrail outside of the office. And I just take part of the light. It was like broken. It was like hanging out of it. And I just took it up and just threw it in the air and just watched the fucking glass break everywhere. And then I look over and I see some guy who's walking by and he's sort of looking at me. And I could tell that, you know, he's, he's not really feeling the fact that he just saw me do that, but I didn't think much of it. And then me and my friend friend both leave we go off on our bikes in two different directions and the cops pull both of us over and they say to my friend they say uh did you break a light he said no they said we just talked to your friend adam and he said that you broke the light which is absolutely not true and he's immediately no he broke the light blah 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 and so then they tell me your friend jared says you broke the light boom i, I go into school and i stay like why the fuck do you snitch on me and he tells me that they had kind of good guy bad cop or good cop bad cop them and there i am done yeah it's crazy these fucking cops they'll outsmart these 16 year olds they'll like get nothing. you they'll get you they they almost shot me once when i was 16 that's another one we were we were having a party one of those parties that got busted 
right? Everybody's drinking. We uh-huh. get into my buddy's uh, car, which we thought was so badass at the time. It was a, one of the, remember those Pontiac Grand Prix GPS supercharged cars? I do have a general idea of what you're talking about, yeah. <laughs> well, in Ohio, in Northeast Ohio, those were basically the fucking Ferrari mm. back then. Looking back on it again, it's basically just a, a, a slightly wider Grand Am. Right. Like, it's like a joke of a car. Uh-huh. Anyway, we thought it was so cool. So anyway, the cops come through the front door. We all run out the back. There's, like, this party with, like, 60, 70, 80 people at it. It's, it's a crazy party. And we all just bail. We run. We get into his car, and we start taking off. But one of the asshole cops just stood right in the middle of the street with his gun out and the red laser right on us. I, as we're pulling up, he's just, stop, you know what I mean, right in the middle of the street as we're driving away yeah and i mean it's literally the red laser i'm seeing it go i'm in the back left right behind the driver and i'm seeing it go off everybody's forehead in the car passenger middle and uh thank goodness my buddy stopped but uh, he wasn't gonna shoot you though i mean had he kept going i mean had my buddy in the driver's seat panicked and just floored it right he definitely would have shot somebody either that or he would have fucking hit a cop yeah that could so be bad. either way it was we were so close to something bad happening it's weird to think that like you go through so much like could you imagine if the comedy world was just constantly under inspection by the cops like if the cops like if you killed a cop then the comedy store is all of a sudden a fucking hot zone and the cops are super concerned about that. Like that could happen mm-hmm. if you killed a cop. I'm yeah. assuming you haven't. No, I haven't. Not mm-hmm. yet. But that actually sounds like it would give me a lot of street cred. Mm. You know, comedians don't really do that. No. Really don't. They really don't. murders. Yeah, they don't kill people. And we don't really like, you know. You can't think of any like famous comedians who have caught murder cases? Not murder. We got some creepy sexual ones, little Bill Cosby, mm. Louis C.K., you know what I mean? We got we got our people out there. Do you think that the the, the, per, the personality type that we associate with comedians is in any way associated with the type of person that might be a little bit creepy and might be weird sexually? Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a stretch. He's like, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Because you're chasing that thing, exactly what we were talking about earlier. Like, it's like this extreme high mm. that happens when you see someone laughing at something that you made them do. Mm. So I feel like everything sort of becomes more numb when you get used to that, that dragon that you're chasing. Right. You're sort of being treated by a God, like a God by the majority of the population or a lot of the people you interact with either way. Yep. And all the work that goes into it and everything you're like, I did this, I controlled that situation. And you know, I can do that. I can move a room of strangers Mm. with high expectations or, you know, when you really sit down in front of a piece of paper, what goes through your head when you're trying to like write a joke? Because I, I think about that that com- comedian process a lot. Because you know, anyone who does a podcast, they like a lot of my fans. If you were to ask them why they like me, they'd probably be like, "Oh, he's funny." But I've never like gone out of my way to like craft a joke or like create a conversation that would be funny. Any any humor that comes out is just happenstance. Like, what, what where does the stuff start bubbling up when you just sit down to write? Well, it comes from one of two places. One, sometimes it's just something that I'm talking about. You know, maybe I'm in the green room before a show or mm-hmm. something like that or after a show and just shooting the shit about something that maybe happened in the news that day. And that's really normally where the seed comes from is mm-hmm. me just hanging out with friends or other comedians. And I'll say something that becomes the start of something but it only starts as a one liner Mm. um but yeah but once i sit down behind paper with it like i'm really trying to if i was trying to come up with a joke from scratch what i usually do is i try to figure out what's the most controversial thing to talk about Mm. what's the most compelling subject matter and then i have to figure out how to make it funny and silly Mm. so like right now the two jokes that i'm most excited about is a brand new abortion joke about Alabama making abortion illegal and this long chunk. It's now really coming together about transgender athletes Mm. because uh, I find it so interesting (laughs) that nobody can talk about it or Mm. say anything about it. And I say sort of everything about it. Right. um, Because you're not going to see that on TV. Mm. And that's another thing that I'm thinking about is what can't be on a Netflix special or a Mm. HBO or a Comedy Central special? What can I give these people that they're literally not used to seeing unless they've seen me or someone crazier at a live show? Will Netflix only give specials to people who basically kind of toe the line in terms of the PC shit? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm. 
I mean, unless it's someone so famous, like, you know, there's this rumor coming out today that they're about to offer Eddie Murphy 70 million to come back to do one special. Wow. And, you know, they'll probably let him maybe do whatever he wants. You know, they'll probably let Chappelle and these people, you know, but really I, from what I understand, they, they, there's certain subjects that they don't want covered. Well, they don't want a, a white male in his 30s talking about trans politics because it's just going to read as bullying, as right. alt right, every type of possible tag they could throw on. Yeah, you, right? 100%. It's either all or nothing now, and mm. and we're and, you know we're the bad guy. I'm not going to lie. I, I, like when I went on Kill Tony as well as last night when I watched your most recent episode and what Plano. Mm-hmm. Yeah, both of those. You said at least a couple of things that my jaw dropped because I was like, you know, as someone who doesn't spend a lot of time in the, the comedy space, you forget how free comedians feel to make certain types of jokes. Like, There's just certain things you were saying about just someone being black or something that I was just like floored. Yeah. Like, this is the real shit. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm comfortable in that zone. And uh on snoop's roast too i heard you say a whole bunch of shit that i was like oh my god i can't believe that was on tv i mean that's a perfect example mm. of where my comfort really comes from it's like it comes from being born and raised in an all black neighborhood mm. so at the end of the day i know that no matter if anyone thinks that what i said might be you know racist or too controversial or this or that i know the line of I tend to I tend to know what my black comedian friends would find hilarious. Not just funny, but if it's a racial joke, I wouldn't do it if I don't think I would make my, those friends laugh extremely right. hard. So it comes from <coughs> comfort and experience, really. There's a weird position to be in. <coughs> Cuz <'Cause, coughs> fuck. Man, this shit is heavy. <coughs> because I put myself in a similar category where I have a ton of black friends and I feel, you know, pretty good at gauging what they're going to think is funny or what might be considered over the line in terms of the jokes that sort of use race as a, as a, a trope or whatever. But man, when that shit gets translated out to like the outside world viewing your content is where all of a sudden your idea of how comfortable you could be really starts to get questioned. But have you really like ran into a lot of blowback from that? Nope. No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't get any of that. If, if anything, if there's ever been anyone that says that anything that I'm saying was over the line, it was somebody that I made fun of directly. Mm. For example, like I once did a show at, a, at this uh, big casino in Connecticut, right? And I'd heard, you know, my buddy warned me, my, uh, my pal Joe Rogan literally said, you know, be careful if you ever perform in Connecticut because it's bad audiences, it's dull people, they don't really get it. That the much. entire state of I Connecticut know, it seems I like know. a vast generalization. I know, and and that's what I thought too. So a gig came in, uh, an offer came around for Connecticut. I'm like, geez, this is a pretty good payday for you Little know, old Tony. A, c- a couple nights of work doing jokes on a stage. I'll take it. You know, mm. I'm staying at a casino. How bad can it be? And there was, a, sure enough, there's this family that comes in. And, uh, you know, you could tell they're all different shapes and sizes and ages. And they're at this casino on their little Connecticut vacation. And that maybe a stand-up comedy show with an edgy comedian isn't exactly what they're <laughs> in it for. You there's this, okay. there's a girl on her phone the whole show. I ignore it. I ignore it. Then she's talking. I start making fun of her. And she can't handle it, but she keeps firing back. So now I have to fire back even more and really own the situation, right? Mm. And uh, so I smashed her real good. <laughs> and, you know, all of a sudden that's what everybody, you know, that becomes the highlight of the show mm. is, you know, this girl trying to get me mm. while I'm doing what I do. And I got her. So then she goes like the blowback is then. So like I say that, you know, it, it looks like her family doesn't even really love her. <laughs> uh, she If she's like this here, she must have... She must be a horrible person everywhere else. Like, I mean, if she's at a comedy show, at a casino, with her family, like, this is a time right. if you were ever going to enjoy yourself, like, you would think it would be now. Mm. So I can't imagine how miserable your life must be. And I'm hitting her mostly with truths. 
You know what I mean? A true, like, psycho a- analysis from the actual situation. It's not like I'm saying, you look like a turkey neck. You know what I mean? Whatever, <laughs> right? I'm literally just like, I don't think people like you very much. And I think your revenge is not having a good time and finding things you can complain about. <coughs> anyway, I was right because she ended up sending, a, you know, a letter to my agent, my manager. I had a, I had a major gig coming up uh, a month later down the road and she wrote to them this long letter about how you shouldn't have this guy he's a he's a bigot he's a hateful Always person so. he's a you know he's he's mean to women like all these things that gave I, I and by the way she said i saw him at a casino show in connecticut and like my agent my manager even the venue that i went to later they show me this thing yeah these people love me. Of course. They're okay. going, Tony, you'll never believe the write-up that this lady gave you, right. right? And they're showing me the copy. I couldn't believe it. But that's where the blowback comes from is the, on occasion, maybe once a week or so, I have to take somebody's soul from them mm. because A, I have a reputation for it and B, I have a reputation for it because I love it. Yeah. You know what I mean? If somebody tries to come at me, it's just simply I have to, I have to, I have to completely destroy them, them. Yeah. right and using that, and, my brain and that's what i realized on the kill tony thing is that there is a very specific part of my personality where i feel like i'm really good at ripping somebody apart and really just i'm just good at making somebody feel bad good at pointing out all the things that are wrong with them and you know, i'm like that with everything I'm, if i look at my own life it's very easy for me to point out all the shitty things whatever that's a part of my life I've never nurtured. If anything, I've always kind of tried to like squish it down because there's really, you know, you learn and having employees or just dealing with people, having conversations with girls. I've definitely like been on a first date where the, an argument that we started having or a little conversation that just got too heated and I was just being too fucking mean, too aggressive. But you've worked your way into a position where it's actually good for you to nurture that part of your personality. It's very unique. It's really wild. And when I first started stand up, I went away from it. I'm like, oh, maybe that, you know, when I really started, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be more like these other, you know what I mean? I see what it's like. You know, you want to get a big audience and you want a mainstream following and mm-hmm. I could be rich and famous. Oh, I could be the next Jimmy Fallon or whatever mm-hmm. it was 12 years ago when I started, whatever seemed like a cool gig. And I sort of hit it away for a few months, mm-hmm. I think, as like a thing like, oh, that's what I was doing to get me to comedy. And then... I sort of had like this Anakin Skywalker type of turn to where I'm like, oh, maybe I just am, Mm. you know, maybe I just am a darker guy. Mm. Like I I should use these things to my advantage. And sure enough, I did. And it all started. And it really, this all stems from me hating my teachers really back in school. They were so mean to me. And I was mean to them. Granted, I loved making rooms laugh back then. Uh, and I, I became addicted to it. And they all told me, you know, it was just like, you're not going to be able to, you're never going to have a normal job. You're not and being mean is never going to get you anywhere mm. and all this stuff. And I really embraced that. And looking back on it, I think that's where a lot of this comes from is this like this vendetta that I have for proving all those teachers wrong. Right. Cause now I'm in the writer's right. guild. Mm. Like that's, cr- <laughs> that would be, that would boggle their minds right. that's to know proof. that. Yeah. This, this is not, you're not messing around. I'm Insurance black paid for mm. right with, with my fricking writing <laughs> of making fun of people. And, uh, so yeah, you, I really did embrace that. Have you ever gone too far on kill Tony to the point where you felt like the audience was turning on you? Um, I've gone too far on them. I'll go on them directly. They don't turn on me if I go too hard on somebody else. But mm. sometimes I'll just that again. It, that's the that's the catch when you like using honesty as the weapon, mm. right? Is like if I come out and I'm like, "What's up? You guys ready for another one?" And it's very mellow, and mm. I go, "Come on, you could do better than that." And it's the same. Then the next maybe hour and forty five minutes is fucked for mm. everybody, right? Because like if they if they if 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 I basically if I get frustrated for them being too mellow mm. of an audience, really not they don't seem loud. You know what I mean? If they just aren't. I like that party vibe of it. If it's going to be a live show in front of a live audience, I, I want to really feel them. I see yeah. that with rappers all the time where if the crowd sucks and the rapper says that the crowd sucks, it almost never works out well for them. Mm-hmm. If, they, if they come at the crowd, like if they're the opener in particular and they're not really, uh, they don't come with a lot of built-in respect, the, uh, the audience 
won't won't give a shit. Like the openers at comedy clubs, you know, they're they're willing to give you a shot. That's one thing that's different. They're definitely willing to give you a shot. If you're an opener at a rap show, to to make them like you from scratch, because nobody fucking likes songs that they're hearing for the first time, right. especially when they're not good songs that are really like catchy and just gonna work their way into your brain right away. For a rapper to go from zero to well liked as an opener is damn near impossible. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard it's it's hard to do that in comedy too, really. I think a lot of people make it look easy, but it's not necessarily easy at all because mm. those people are either and it really depends on who they're there to see. Mm. Like if it's a smarter comedian, that's great, you know. If it's for example, like opening for Joe Rogan's great because it has this culture of, you know, an educated type of like, you right. know, a curious, smart, intelligent human Right. And is basically Joe his, loves you. So therefore, the audience is probably going to like you. Yeah. Because they like Joe. Right. And, and they and probably also have a large percentage of them have seen you with Joe. Right. In general. And they have an open mind. You know what I mean? Really, it's like that's a big part. Um, but if they're there, you know, if they're there to see someone that they just know from like, you know, TV or something like that, then it's probably a little bit rougher of a crowd. Mm. But yeah, when someone says that the, they don't like the show already, those people feel bad, especially even if they're the biggest fans. Mm. Like, they feel bad. They're like, man, this show sucks. We're here in Buffalo. And he just said Rochester was more <laughs> fun last night. Yeah. That fucking hurts, mm. man. Because you know you you got the, you know, you start picturing the people you don't like from Rochester that they had more fun with than you. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just all this. Last night when I was watching you, it was such a different show than the one that I was on because you're in fucking Plano. So it's just all these regular ass people getting on stage and just doing horrible. And when, when I was with you doing it, <laughs> there was like a bunch of people who were horrible, but there was a bunch of people who clearly were like out to be comedians at the very least, even if they weren't great, they were like acceptable. They were trying. And it was just such a different experience. <laughs> you were just roasting these people alive because they, they're just coming out and telling jokes that don't even sound like jokes. It's a weird feeling to just be left hanging at the end. Like, that was the punchline. Those ones on the road are so much fun. Yeah. I mean, that's what I can't believe that that's been able to be executed so perfectly because those episodes are, to me, a lot more interesting than the ones at home field. You know, right. the ones in L.A., the people already made it to L.A. Mm. They either just moved here or even if they're just visiting, it's like they had the they were able to save enough money to be able to get on a flight to get there and be there. And, mm. you know what I mean? It already takes a certain amount of, uh, you know, life to mm. be able to get to there. Right. But to get to Plano, if you live 10 minutes down the street and you listen to the podcast and. You don't even have a car, you know what I mean, or whatever. These, it's so interesting. A lot to of people see. clearly never even listen to the podcast either. Yeah, there's a there's always a couple who <laughs> yeah. are just like, "What is this? I'll do it, dude." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stone to the gullet. There's a girl. I forget what the what was that word that she used that a guy came up to her and said she Bolt. was bolted. She goes, "A guy came up to me and told me that I was bolted, like <laughs> as in like a way of saying she was hot." And she that was her whole joke was just like, "Look at this, this weird word that a dude called me." It's like that's not a joke. Wow, I don't even remember that. <laughs> Gosh. I only remember because I called him into the room like, listen to this joke. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that. <laughs> you were there and you didn't even really hear it. Uh -huh. Did you see the guy that got pulled out in that show in the, from the front row that uh, is, a, is a kung fu uh, master? Oh, and he started telling you about it, yeah. There's a little like there's a little like dorky guy that was being silly in the very front row the whole time. Uh -huh. so, I mean, this little, literally I made a joke about how it's like, where's Waldo's grandson or whatever. <laughs> Just this little dorky, big, thick-rimmed glasses guy, uh, and he got pulled out organically. You know, that's another fun thing is the op uh, the range of opportunity on that show is so crazy. It yeah. really is a bucket of destiny. So I pull his name out after I'd already been giggling about him, which, I, again, I very rarely do. But this guy had so much charisma that I acknowledge him. And I pull him out. He does a set. It's his first set ever. Went pretty decent. But... Uh, but then we start talking and it turns out that this fucking guy can do anything. This little like dweeb is like super Bruce Lee goes to the world invitational. I had him. He did the bottle cap challenge live on this show. Got it. He kicked a hat off of Jeremiah's head. Whoa. Jeremiah was this. OK. Yeah. It was at the end. Jeremiah was playing George W. Bush. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was hilarious. Oh, I mean, it was just so fun. Mm. So like the stuff, there's always a contrast when the when things go weird on that show. It usually means. 
there's an opposite about to happen right around the how, corner. How big of a factor was bringing like Jeremiah and Red Band? Like, did you try doing it with just you or with a smaller cast? Or you always knew that you needed like extra jokes coming in? It's always been both Red Band and I, okay. uh, no matter what. We started bringing Jeremiah just a couple, couple few years ago uh-huh. uh, here and there. And then it just got bigger and bigger. And, and now we have Joel with us most of the time. You know, in a whole drum set, he's sponsored by Ludwig from being part of a comedy wow. band, Look which is that. insane. <laughs> His name on that client list just brings so much joy to my heart. <laughs> he's right there with like, I don't know, all the best drummers. Right. It's None so of which crazy. we can name. The guy with one arm from Def Leppard. For sure. That's pretty much it. Yeah. No, Travis Barker. Yep. He's one of the guys. Man. It's hard to be a famous drummer. It really is. <laughs> I keep wanting to say flea, but he's definitely a bass player. Right, there but you I'm go. But I'm so stoned that just the word flea keeps popping it's up. It's just in my head. one of those other irrelevant uh, instruments that we're. It's impossible for us to focus on because it just seems like the singer is the only thing that really, really matters. How unfair is that? It's tough, man. Yeah, you got any musical talent? A little bit. I could play some instruments. I oh, could do man. some stuff. You ever think about going down that lane or no? Yeah. Yeah. Last I, time I saw you, you were working on some kind of rap alter ego. Yep. I'm still working on it. I'm going <laughs> to debut it one day and no one's going to know it's me. Really? Secret rapper. Heck yeah. It's, it's, my, it's, my, it's my super goal. I mean, it was like that's one conclusion that I feel like a lot of these YouTubers come to is that if you like there's something addictive about music in terms of the views and stuff, like if, if you can really make a song that people will just listen to over and over, there's a certain infectious element to that that just doesn't occur with any other art forms. I'm obsessed with music. It's mm. all I fucking do. What do you mostly listen to? Everything. Every single thing. I know a lot of people say that, but yeah. I truly, it's just a balance. I'll go <laughs> from, I mean, not that, not that much country at all. Mm. But then again, there's fucking Johnny Cash and mm-hmm. all these, you know, there's so many. Yeah. But how are you finding about or discovering music? I really go through, um, I used to go off, I mean, I just sort of do it organically, really. I'll just scan through whether it's a radio station or someone's playlist or this or that. But uh, but it's all day, all night, Every everything that I'm writing always, when I, again, when I take it in, to work on it Uh always headphones and when i'm on writing jobs always headphones and when i started uh writing on shows it wasn't even that wasn't even a thing that people did like i felt like i was being rebellious by being really into music but yeah when everybody would go write, maybe they'd write with the partner this and that i'd throw on headphones and just get to it Uh and you know when we would send it in and everyone would read you know the the magic was there. It's weird. I was, I was thinking recently because I, I sometimes have this guilt of like my whole life is based around music, but then I don't have any kind of physical relation to music. Everything I listen to is just through Apple music. It just feels kind of hollow and like, it's just, it, you don't have that physical element. I just, I'm kind of forget about that feeling of having like a CD library and being able to look at that. And you're just sort of feeling the, 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 various paths that your ta- your taste has taken you down in terms of your music fandom. So I was thinking about becoming a record player guy. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's kind of an expensive hobby. Record player guy. You know, there's those guys out there. Yeah. We just have a record player and they collect records. Yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> You're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what inspired me, though? You know what made me want to start doing, uh, start to start actually putting together, uh, goofing around, writing raps was uh, that bad, bad, is it Bad Baby? Bad Baby. Bad Baby. One of the biggest interviews I ever done. Really? Had her on a couple of times. Was yeah. she fun? She's definitely fun. There's so <laughs> many memes that came out of that. It was incredible, honestly. <laughs> wow. Because she would just come on here. She's been associated with all these rappers or whatever that she either has dated or had beef with or whatever and she just comes on here and just she doesn't have a button to turn it off in terms of just talking shit yeah zero percent holding back just going all in i love that that's so cool it was fun good for her anyway so i i ended up going down this rabbit hole when her album came out and i listened to it and i mean it's a I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Like Hmm. maybe it was just my speakers in my car. I mean, I couldn't believe it, what she was able to do. Mm. I I mean, I thought it was so cool. I mean, I'm addicted to having no musical talent, but still being able to make music that is catchy and enjoyable. Exactly. Mm. That's exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) 
that and that that 2019 it, it's crazy yeah it, it's so well produced that even with that stuff going on around it and what she's talking about and everything i thought it was so just different and cool mm, i'm actually i want to get your opinion on an artist what do you think well, I mean, I like it. What am I? What am I? What exactly? Meg the Stallion, big old freak, is what I just played for the record. For um, the first one minute and eleven seconds, she's uh, taken the hip hop world by storm. By far, probably the most popular female rapper out besides Cardi B and Nicki. Wow, really? Yeah. When? When? How long has she been like out for? A couple months. Like really, only this this whole wave that she has has only taken place over the past couple months, four months maybe. That's so interesting. Crazy, right? It's crazy who takes off and who doesn't. Mm. I mean, I like to think, I'm surprised, I don't know if she, my thing is like, it's sort of like what I like with my stand-up, right? Like it's, it's got to feel a little bit dangerous. Mm. Does it that edgy sense. enough for you? I mean, it's sexual, but I like a little bit of danger. I always like the fact that Cardi is sort of bragging about being a stripper, you mm. know, an ex stripper or whatever. Like it's, I, she doesn't do the stripper talk, but she does like she, her, her wave is that her attitude towards men, I would say is kind of like, I'm the shit. You're lucky to even be around me. Eat my ass. Buy me expensive handbags. Fuck you. All right, well, <laughs> and I maybe I'll let you hit. That's so interesting. She hasn't popped up on any of my <clears throat> algorithms yet. I mean, 26 million on this video. She, um, the other main things, like the, the two things about her, <clears throat> one, no plastic surgery. So a lot of people think that's pretty cool given today's day and age. There's a lot of plastic surgery going around. And B, writes all her own raps, or at least says she does. And I guess I give her uh, the benefit of the doubt. That helps a lot. You know, because I mean, yeah. Cardi gets a lot of shit for that. Yeah. People assuming that she gets a lot of help. Yeah. I like, uh, what is it, Tayana? Tiana Taylor? Yeah. Mm. What about Tiana Trump? Oh, I know who that is. Who's that? The porn star? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I saw th I saw one of her uh, most <laughs> recent works. <laughs> she came on here and exposed all these like basketball players for fucking her when she was 16 and shit. Oh, my God. Not by name, but she like gave weird identifying characteristics so people were kind of <laughs> able to guess. Number 34 for your right. Houston Rockets. <laughs> I mean, and that's actually how she threw some people off the, the, the scent because she uh, she didn't... She, she said that like one dude was like top five earners in the NBA and it wasn't actually true. He's like close, but he's not yeah. actually there. Yeah. So it gave people a lot of information to work with. Yeah. We know the real culprits, but... Well, yeah. I'll take it to the grave. My goodness. <laughs> NBA players. What a fun life that is, huh? I guess. Hanging out with her. She, well, her new thing, she was going viral. She was trending yesterday because she is claiming that she's just going to do a tour of the college circuit. Just fucking college students, I believe. Wow. <laughs> Some kind of tour, huh? Wow. It's a tour. We had a we had an actual prostitute get pulled out of the bucket on uh, on Keltoni on and Monday. And she was honest about it. It was her opener. It was her closer. She talked about it the whole time. Holy shit! I interviewed the hell out of her. Wow. It's so interesting, man. I gotta see that. Yeah. Which ep which episode was that? This is the most recent one. It was uh, Ian Edwards was the guest. Okay. So. Any uh, interesting revelations for you? I mean, yeah. I asked her. I asked her what the most amount of guys she had ever been with in a day. Uh -huh. She said five. And she okay. said that three, only three of them were work things that she like had to hook up with two guys in between just to like cleanse her palate from hooking up with nasty dudes. Sometimes she needed to be like reminded that she's loved and like beautiful or whatever by someone that's just fucking her without paying her. Wow. So it's almost like the ginger in between sushi bites, like bad sushi, like, oh, I don't like that, right. and then try another one. That's they, how I feel when I have to listen to, like, five million shitty songs that have been submitted in a row. And it's yeah. like, I got to just go listen to some fucking stuff I'm genuinely into. They made a sign that said car keys to ask me for my car keys. You could just say it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea, though. I appreciate the thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bigger distraction. <laughs> Just writing it down than it would have been uh, had he just said it. Probably one of the <laughs> the most jarring thing that I ever had a porn star say on here to me, I think, was when this girl, uh, Alina Lopez, told me that she was doing a scene and basically the guy was having a hard time staying erect. So she ate his ass for 20 or 30 minutes wow. so that he could get hard <laughs> while she was texting her boyfriend. Oh, my God. 
so many elements of that story just blew my mind to smithereens, dude. Jeez Louise. So she's going no hand ass eating? Mm. Just sort of like, is that the no look? How do you do both? I want to know what position this guy was in. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about be... it. He needs to be doggy style so that she could kind of just prop the phone up while going to town. Hey, Siri. Type <laughs> text message to my boyfriend. <laughs> Tell him I said hello. Alexa, te- te- text the love of my life. <laughs> And who the fuck is this weird ass dude who the only solution to him not being able to get hard was to have his ass eaten for a half hour by this beautiful girl. That's the thing. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. Those are the types of problems. Like, it's like, what? How are you in that business? If that's, you know what I mean? But I hear about it all the time because, you know, that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize about the male porn star world is that a lot of these guys are in business because they have massive dicks, but every other part of their personality doesn't really align with being a good male porn star. For instance, I had a girl tell me about this dude who who he showed up and he smelled so bad. He smelled like alcohol. He had Coke around his nose. But this is a dude with like one of the biggest dicks out. And then I, I think I think she said he escaped through the window at some point because he like wanted to go keep getting fucked up. So he left in the middle of the shoot. Wow. But his dick is so massive that he's he's still in demand. Good lord. That's unbelievable, man. Could what, be me. What a crazy business. Yeah. I just saw a guy today in uh, on a wrestling uh on a wrestling site about how they're and it's like breaking. I mean, we've never even seen this guy before. Do you see the thing today? There's a guy seven foot two mm-hmm. out of nowhere, and they have him in this thing NXT. Mm-hmm. He's basically, you know, just this new. He's gonna be a freak. Uh-huh. Like it's, it, it, he's, he's gonna no matter what he does, unless <laughs> his knees literally explode up from underneath them. Right. There's nothing that can stop his trajectory in the pro wrestling world. Right. And they work around that in pro wrestling and porn. I guess they work around it probably there too. Right. These people have not being able to speak. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, all kinds of fake shit. You know, a yeah. lot of times when you see a photo of a girl and she's just got a bright, glimmering, just mountain of cum on her face, that it's this stuff, uh, Cetaphil. It's kind of like soap. Ah, I not always real. wonder what that is. It's not real cum, but it looks just like cum. It looks better than cum. Yeah. Real cum is all chunky and weird. Right. Or too thin. Too thin. <laughs> nice clear. stringy load. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like angel hair, <laughs> like the pasta, like a noodle machine. You have issues with that? You ever look at your load and just like, that's just not satisfactory? Oh, yeah, that's fucking eggshells right there. Mm. Uh, what is it? Uh, rigatoni. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of pasta is your nut is a very good question. <laughs> um, no, that was actually, you know, like you read a million negative comments about yourself and it doesn't really do too much to your self-esteem at a certain point, but then you'll read one comment that just fucking digs into your soul. Somebody got at me on uh, the Kill Tony comment section, I remember, and just said, like, Adam 22 sucked. Uh, all, he, all he did was talk about sex or something, which, and then I've been re- like, thinking about it, I'm like, oh, they're, they're right. Like, probably every joke on that that I made was related to that in some way, and it just, it stood out to me, like, yes, I probably did do that. But I also just felt, like, number one, I was high as fuck. I got so high that day. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm on stage with you and you're a fucking black belt at dissecting these people. Didn't really know what I was in for. And uh, yeah, d- didn't really feel that, that confident about my performance. Oh no, man. Yeah, no, that's crazy because that's a whole different element. Mm. So we have, sometimes we have some of the literally greatest comedians on the planet. Mm. We have all of them. All, all my favorite comedians are rotating in and out of that thing. And... To be able to ha- get anything at all that entertained anyone is a miracle because they're used to literally always seeing just black belt, you know, mm. comedians. If if we don't have a full time comedian on, then it's a very special, you know, treat. It's mm. like a it's someone that we wanted to have, you know. It's it's so what you did was great. And my point is, is sometimes we have people that perform in front of live audiences every single night and they freeze up, mm. you know, and then they come back and it's better. And it is a very particular talent. You know, if you're if you're really, really good at sitting in your room and writing jokes, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'd be good at, you know, I, I heard you call a woman uh, that you said that she looked like a dolphin with Down syndrome. Wow. 
that really particularly hit home. That's she must have really looked like a dolphin with Down syndrome. No, yeah, it definitely stood out as for, something that had a lot of truth to it, which is the crazy part. For me to say that, I mean, I want to see video of this chick because my guess is it's a dolphin with Down syndrome. Right. Yeah. Just uh, talking. I mean, someone's new character. Doesn't that sometimes? feel kind of shitty that you do so many podcasts so many things that i could say something like that that should be pretty significant like every person you've had come up on the show you know should occupy some space in your brain but you've done so many that it just becomes this big blur it's pretty crazy because i i i I feel like if i started to reflect too much Mm. on anything and when i do have to watch or listen for something every once in a while uh i i I, 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 I don't like it. I, it's, I don't think it helps me because mm. I'm always looking at the future and keeping it refillable. One thing I'll say is that I'm surprised that I've said these things and don't remember them because I do take some pride in not repeating jokes on this show mm. unless I like acknowledge it. Like I always say that with people that look like, you know what I mean? Mm. I'll, you know, if it's, if it's perfect for the person in the moment, I'll fire it off. But I try to not do repeats and now you've reminded me of three things that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> and, uh, I'm like, maybe I just think I re- don't repeat myself. Maybe I just don't remember. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's fun. It's weird because, okay. As a human being, if you just tell the same stories all the time in conversation with people, I mean, that's not that out of the ordinary. We know a lot of people that just sort of fall back on sort of repeating their greatest hits per se, but as a comedian or a person who does podcasts, if there's like a recording of you, all of a sudden you're kind of self-conscious about that because, you know, me, me telling you some story from some random other podcast I did six months ago, I mean, it's still every bit as relevant in the conversation, but then you're kind of conscious of the fact that the, the viewers could be uh, getting bored with that. Yeah. Kind of sucks. Yeah. But that's also part of the beauty in it. You know, you watch something on CBS. I mean, I don't want to give, I mean, yeah, geez, I shouldn't have said that. CBS? You say, you say you know something, you say, you, I meant to say network television. Right. Uh, and it's just so overproduced and, mm. you know, sort of like just, and they're really, they're really doing the same stuff all the time. Mm. Uh, I think that's one of the things that's cool about podcasts is that we even think that way or, or looking ahead and, you know, trying to just, you know, Sometimes you just cover stuff and sometimes, you know, it's just more raw Mm. and it's such a necessity now. I'm so fascinated by just the concept of building rapport. Like if, if me and you sat here for the next two years, every week we do one podcast by the end of that period, our dialogue or like our conversation is, would be so much more advanced because there's so much basic stuff that's sort of being cleared out and becoming too obvious to even talk about And that's just like an interesting thing and watching that build over years and seeing people on camera together, like seeing you and Red Band together after having done this for so many years, it's just kind of fascinating. And you could take two really, really funny people and put them together and not have great chemistry, even if they're independently hilarious. Yeah. Sometimes people work great together that don't even like each other. Mm. That's always the stuff that has always really intrigued me. Like my favorite, uh, my favorite artist of all time that I think, you know, is truly just the thing I could listen to anytime is Pink Floyd. Mm. And the two creative forces of that, the two, the bass player creator, Roger Waters, and the guitarist, usually lead singer, but sometimes Roger Waters would be the lead singer too. And they didn't even like each other. Mm. So a lot of the stuff that happened there was them trying to outdo one another literally like you know roger would lay down a bass line and have these lyrics written for you know the song that means more to him than anything this Mm. comfortably numb and he hands it to david gilmore like hey here you go learn this put some guitar riffs in there and david gilmore's like i'm gonna make this the biggest exactly make everybody pay attention to me right Mm. and it's healthy competition these guys are pushing each other so by the time you hear the finished product you know you have these, this real, you know, fire, this real passion that was behind it. Instead of that's good enough, it was, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you. I mean, literally they hated each other. Mm. And this was, these were the first people to, you know, add real lights and people used to just perform in front of a blank curtain. Mm. 
And Pink Floyd was the first to add colorful lights and all these different elements and inflatables and lasers and neons and all this stuff that is now natural. Mm -hmm. They were always so far ahead, adding these to their music too. And uh, they still do that nowadays. They invest heavily in going way over the top on visual and anything. If you ever, have you ever seen Pink Floyd live? I haven't. Pink Dude. Floyd is still together. Well, no, they're not. But if you see Roger Waters or David Gilmour, it's basically the... Wait, so they don't get along to the point where they now tour separately? Oh, they, they literally, they're the biggest broken up band oh, of okay. all time. They, I mean, they truly have always hated one another. They got together once and played three songs together at, that was li it? at Live 8. Yeah. They were supposed to do three songs or it got cut short now, because there was so much animosity? That's it. They did three songs. They fucking destroyed and got out. Wow. Yeah. It, it, and give Dark Side of the Moon a re-listen. I, I think that's a thing that, you know, anybody should really listen to. Right. To think that those guys made that album. Turn it up real loud and realize it was made in like 72 or 74. You know anything about the roots of the beef? Uh, how, how the fuck did they even end up in a band together in the first place if right. they hated each other as much? Right. I mean, it really started because I, I don't really know if there was any specific one thing. I just think they never really, I think Roger was probably a tough guy to get along with, a real, you know, alpha, I mean, a real probably tough dude, creative right. force. I mean, you see these guys way back in that day and you're like, oh, that's something crazy. And also, neither one of them were the original front man. Uh. The original guy, Sid Barrett, was a musical guru who did so many drugs that he lost his mind. He used to rub LSD on his head uh, before live concerts that the bright lights would hit the LSD on his actual body and it would go into his bloodstream. What In fact, fuck? almost all of the songs that Pink Floyd have done are about their former frontman, Sid Barrett. Oh. And it wasn't until Sid Barrett was gone until they gained extreme success. Wow. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. I I'm mean, really like Pink Floyd was one of those bands that occurred in my like 13, 14 year old period of my life. At which point I would have not been curious enough to really like find out about the, the people involved, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I kind of was oblivious to that. It's crazy. When I, when I was in high school, I just got off on this stoner tangent and that was one of the main things. I give them a lot of the credit on getting me into art, period. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these tough cities in the country, you know, like the dilapidated city I'm from, uh, you, you don't, you're not encouraged that you can be an artist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess now with the internet, you can watch that. But at least when I was growing <clears throat> up, like no one was saying you can do right. whatever you want. It's like you got to get ready for college and get it, become an engineer or something. You know, when I was uh, growing up, Youngstown was kind of like a mecca to me because I was in the BMX world and that was where some of the biggest skate parks were. And huh. the scene there was huge. A lot of like super legendary BMX riders from Youngstown, Ohio. Wow. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Weird. Right. I bet yeah. you never thought that you would hear me recognize it or give a shit about it in any way. Right? No, yeah. No, it's crazy. Yeah. I didn't even realize that existed there at all. I used to know this girl who had a tattoo of the Diplomats logo, the Dipset, the rap group, which there was like a big, it's like a big eagle and just a Diplomats, but it said Youngstown. Hell yeah. Yeah. I love it. She never let me hit. <laughs> um, I wanted to get your thoughts on this video. This is FBG Duck Slide. So I think it's fascinating. Th does this really have 50 million views or are you messing with well, me? Well, 46 million for the record. I but mean... It's so crazy. It's like in a normal apartment. Uh, yeah. Like I always, I can't always, I can never help. Even back when I was in high school and I was looking at the No Limit albums and everything, like it's always intrigued me. <laughs> I, I'm sort of a fan of getting things done big on a low production value. Right. Like I respect that. Yeah. I mean, I, think about what is actually going on in that room. It's one camera, like 10 guns. At one point, the guy's <laughs> holding up an E pill. <laughs> That, I like the fact that he holds up the E pill. That's very like in your face. Like, look, like, because what is that? Like you're fucking 10 dudes in a room with guns. It's just you. You don't need those guns. Nobody's showing up to this fucking Airbnb. And then <laughs> and you're taking ecstasy with a bunch of other dudes. Like this is what we're, we've come to. Like this is a strange state of affairs. 
Oh, God, I love it, man. Yeah. When she, I do ecstasy, I'm a weird, creepy... F- I'm just sitting there grabbing my girl's legs, squeezing as hard as I can. I'm a weirdo off that shit, bro. I only did it once, man, and I didn't do it right because I did it the I did, uh, I did did it the first night that I ever did mushrooms, uh, too. Wow. I just did them both at the same time. That's an idea. <laughs> that was a crazy night. You were just partying out of control? It was out of control. I lost my wallet that night. It was the first big night of uh, Bonnaroo. Oh, wow. I was fresh out of high school. Wow. Yep. Holy shit. And it poured down rain that night. I saw the Grateful Dead and like, I don't know, some other crazy stuff. But it poured down rain, downpour. And yeah. I went back to my tent and it was flooded. Wow. And my sleeping bag and pillow <laughs> and my backpack that were all in the tent were flooded. Right. Everything's just soaked. You realize you're, you have nothing dry to your name. But you're for, on ecstasy and mushrooms. Absolutely. <laughs> Like, At one point, I sat do? in the car. I sat in the back seat of a car by myself because, mm. like, the car that we drove was still there, but everybody else was doing something. And I just wanted to like gather my thoughts, so I popped the back seat. And it's pouring down rain outside, right? right. You can't hear anything or see anything. And I'm sitting in that back seat, just sort of tripping my balls off. And I, I'll never forget sitting behind the driver's seat and I look up and I'm looking at the front windshield and then I look up a little more and there's the rear view mirror and it's pointed right back at me. Oh. <laughs> I stared at myself. <gasps> like all I could see were my eyes because it was just already there. And uh-huh. I stared at that little rear view mirror right in my own eyes for like, I don't know. <laughs> could have been anything really. Could have been 45 minutes, could have been 10 minutes, but it felt like it felt like about an hour. Just right. like I just like stopped like life just stopped could you, could you still go to a music festival these days or does that not appeal to you anymore because as a 35 year old you're really pushing the limits of acceptability by going to a music festival you know right i, mean, I guess if i had one like a fancy bus or something that'd be fine <laughs> right if the hotel's right there right i could probably swing it but coachella is not really like that like even no, no matter how popping you are it seems like for the most part you're walking some ridiculous dis actually no actually it was nice this year i, I went we, they had like a uber station just walk right in they had all the ubers lined up it was beautiful that's nice yeah i haven't made it to coachella yet i'm always working when those things are happening mm. i gotta be more strategic about it i mean it's weird to a lot of people think of it as just a time for them to go and just do an absurd amount of drugs and that is the part that doesn't really appeal to me anymore and now when i go to music festivals i'm usually either interviewing people and filming or i'm just like i went to coachella i didn't really give a shit i just went because my girl was going and i figured i had to uh but i didn't get fucked up or any any drugs smoke weed the whole time that's about it you ever been to a comedy festival no you should go to Skank Fest next year in New York City. Skank Fest? Yeah. Is it like a bunch of ska bands play in between? No. No, no yeah. it's cool. It's like this, uh, it's just a it's just an all out fucking, you know, multiple shows going on at once in one big giant venue. Right. And monster comedians. Really? Yeah. I don't know like what what is that that vibe or that environment like? I feel like such a fish out of water there as somebody whose like comedy knowledge is relatively limited. Yeah. You got what, that weed? Um but yeah, it's just, I mean, it speaks for itself. Like any room that you walk into, you don't really want to, like, it doesn't even matter if you're, if you're not a big comedy fan, you're just going to have fun no matter what, because right, you don't yeah. need to know what you're even going into. That is where the comedy, as much as it seems like a fringe community is like one of these things that anyone can appreciate the same way with music. It's exactly that because, and you have to see it live once mm-hmm. and that's all it really takes in my opinion is seeing it live not you know when I, I didn't even get it when i was really watching it on hbo as a kid and mm. you know whatever it seems like this unattainable right. crazy thing you know it, who it, is eddie murphy he's just some star some famous guy exactly you don't look at a movie and just think like oh i could be an actor or at least i didn't as a kid i never really popped in my head that this was something i could go do right and no one tells you that you can do it. I always assumed, for some reason, I remember always thinking that like comedians must be like the rich sons and daughters of like the people that make movies and TV. Yeah. For some reason, Nepotism. I always had the yeah, exactly. The only I, thing that could possibly make this happen. Right. That's what I always assumed when I saw a newer comedian. I'm like, mm-hmm. who are these people? When I was in high school and stuff, and you'd see somebody on, I don't know, Conan or whatever. It's like what. How do you even, jeez. Yeah. Unless it's one of the legends. How but, did you crack the code? Uh, 
as far as to even start or even get into that environment what led you there it's really wild i just always wanted to do it uh-huh. cuz i just always loved that feeling but um i actually got talked into it i got like really pushed to do it by sitting at my local starbucks uh one day when How long I, ago this was uh like 13 years ago mm-hmm. and um, I'm sitting there and I had made friends with Shia LaBeouf's dad Wow! at the time. He would always sit outside of this Starbucks. There's a whole, you know, a whole Networking. community thing, basically. This yeah. is the value of being in LA if you're someone who has at least decent personality skills. Mm-hmm. And if you hang out at the right coffee shop a few times, you find out oh, like, oh, you know, Dice goes to this coffee shop. Mm. You know what I mean? It's just literally like... You know, there's people all around in L.A. It's nuts. Look, we just found out you and I live probably within blocks of each other. Never would have thought, yeah. As big as the city is, it's also real small. Mm. Anyway, and he basically explained to me that, uh, because I'm like, yeah, he's like, you know, what are you doing artistically, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm about to start stand-up. I think I'm going to go to an open mic around here and Mm. start and then eventually, you know, work my way up to be able to do something else. And he's like, no, you should go to the comedy store and you should just start there. Mm. He's like, sink or swim. And at the time... Especially back then, I mean, Shia LaBeouf's on top of the world right. just signed a six picture deal with Steven Spielberg. There had been nothing like it yet. Now he's they just were, walking around down here just taking pictures with people on the block. I love it. They were filming <laughs> Transformers back then. And that's before every remake had been made. Right. You know what I mean? Like Transformers being made 13 years ago was a huge deal. Yeah. And so, you know, I didn't really have any other buddy with any like artistic credit at the time. I was just hanging out with my brother who, you know, is a bartender and a baseball umpire and a badass motherfucker, but he didn't know anything about the industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when Shia LaBeouf's dad told me to go start at the comedy store and try my hardest there and sink or swim, I just fucking, I, I just did it. Were your, uh, were your first attempts God awful or actually my first attempt to ever, Performed there. Went great. Really? Yeah. Signed up for the open mic. Nobody knew who I was. Uh, and I got up. And um, it went well because I uh, I actually forgot my set. I blanked out. I got so excited. And it, all the blood just rushed out of my brain at one point as I'm walking on the stage. And I literally forgot everything that I had prepared for two, three months before that to do Holy for a shit. three minute set, mind you. Wow. So it's like all, all I had to do was remember the topic or right. anything, but I just completely blanked out. So what came out? That my opening line was, you know, something like, hi, I'm Tony Hinchcliffe and, uh, and, um, uh, I just forgot everything <laughs> that I wanted to talk with you about. Which is like probably the last thing you would ever want to hear on kill Tony. That's like the least professional, most ridiculous thing you could ever hear from someone. Well, at that point I would be listening to how they're saying it. Mm. And, and if it's real, cause if it's real, that's amazing. Right. Right. If they're faking it, then it's the worst shit ever. There's a charismatic way that you could be saying that. Absolutely. Mm. And, but, but my point, my point is that if it's hitting them that hard, that's exciting. Mm. And by the way, that kill Tony crowd would love that. And that crowd that night loved it because they were watching people go through well rehearsed, like, you know, these people, probably 12 of the best open micers at the time in LA just went on before me. Right. So they're seeing these people give these performances one after the other. And I go up and blank out. Mm. And, and, and I just sort of stayed in that pocket. I go, yep, still don't remember. Not even, you know, but I was sort of like working the room naturally. And it's basically, that whole thing's really part of my backbone is being able to just sort of sometimes, you know, take chances creatively mm. by letting go of, letting go of safety. Does that still happen to you quite often? Blanking out never happens. Oh, not not blanking but, out, but just sort of riffing freestyle. Absolutely. Really? Oh man, I just did a whole weekend in uh, in Dallas specifically because I had already done Dallas. Uh, I've already done. I've ju- I'm just. I've basically been doing Dallas too much. Right. So instead of um, uh, repeating any jokes, I did a new thirty minutes that I haven't written. Uh, or that I hadn't performed there since my last time there, which was only 
I think basically six months ago. Right. And uh, specifically designated the other half, whether it be before or spread out or sandwiched between the jokes to just have fun with mm -hmm. that audience and riff some things and tag some things in ways that I haven't before, you know, work the jokes differently. Right. And Texas it up a little bit because it's, you know, mm. a lot of fun down there. Right. Those people know how to enjoy. It's unbelievable what places fucking love art really? and respect art in some places that don't. And you can sort of go on, go in on their local culture oh, a little they bit. They love it, man. Although they were like when some of the Bush jokes uh, that uh, what's his, <laughs> Jeremiah was doing, yeah. the crowd definitely wasn't feeling a plano there. You could hear some booze in the background. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That was funny as hell. I mean, it's just so, that's, that's exactly why Jeremiah is so great is because he just <laughs> hits it right head on, stays yeah. in that pocket, doesn't show any fear or reaction. Uh -huh. They love that. His George W. Bush. I forgot how fucking funny George W. Bush was, man. <laughs> he did it so good without really making too much of an effort to look like him, yeah. but still completely pulled it off. Yeah. Completely I was wondering. I don't know if you heard the part where I'm, he was... We, we were laughing earlier in the day because he wore that leather jacket right. out of the airport. Yeah. And it, we land in Texas. It's literally 100 <laughs> degrees a week ago in Texas. And he's wearing that jacket. And I'm like, what is going on here? And yeah. then I... He told me, like, oh, it has to do with the character. I'm like, all right. And then right. I started making fun of him. Can't wait to see your Rocketeer, your Indiana Jones, and all these different making right. fun of this jacket. I had no idea, though. Do you, um, do, you ever have, do you have any anxiety when you go on stage at this point? Or is there any kind of different feeling you have? Mm, it's not anxiety. It's definitely, like, covering all my bases, mm. you know, if that makes sense. Sort of having not a plan, but just making sure that my sort of like my checklist is done mm. you know just making sure that my zippers up and that my belts fasten and my fucking you know what i mean just all the basic mm. shit uh but anxiety not really i mean i've been really lucky to get to do a lot of fun gigs and i'm not really getting there's not even at all nervousness because now it's the things that I would get nervous for. I'm the most excited for, mm. you know, like on 420, I opened for Rogan and, uh, and we did, um, an arena 420 San Diego nighttime arena, arena right in the middle. Like? It's basically, and it was in the round, which means it's, you know, it's in the middle of the, so you're surrounded middle of the arena so surrounded by the how many people in an arena, 20,000 or something, uh, something like that. A little bit less than that. Yeah. I think. Just a touch less than 20. I think 20 is a big one. That's crazy. Um, and yeah, and I'm moving around and looking at everybody and taking my time and all that. And it's like, that's something that you would think I would get nervous for is doing 20 minutes in an arena by yourself, just mm. plugged into a microphone. But that that's the most exciting shit. Mm. You know, that's me. Make, I'm on a show like that. I'm making sure that I don't get out of breath backstage if that makes sense. Right. Like, it's like, I don't want to overdo how excited I am. Cause what I want to be doing is fucking jumping jacks and, you know, drop steps and fuck, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just fake air, you know, shadow boxing right before you go out there. It's hard to not do these things. Right. That's just like the best feeling in the world for yeah. you at that moment. Absolutely. Like a, you, you got a still... water, you have the coffee that you brought <laughs> there. You have a, a sugar-free Red Bull. If you want a sip of that, there's a goddamn little sip of, red wine you know uh, what i mean at th that point you have two different vape pens your jewel right i got it all laid out there <laughs> on those big shows so that you can literally take your brain to exactly you know where you want to be right i think that's what everybody wants right that's crazy yeah it's almost like if, i feel like a lot of people if they were to get like musicians whatever they get to that point where all of a sudden you're in that moment of really being able to just do your thing in front of all these people and it's it's like they've finally accomplished what they've always wanted and having what you've always wanted is so overwhelming and intimidating that they find some way to fuck it up by either becoming totally ungrateful and just not fucking caring anymore or getting so into uh, drugs or whatever that they just somehow lose track of it or the music starts to suck and they can't draw those crowds anymore. It feels like a lot of people just have some, some kind of self-destructive urge comes out of that. Well, I feel like and a crazy part is, is that I always thought that those people 
that are like that are the ones that, what, they come from nothing and this and that, right? But the more that I've been paying attention to things lately, and again, I'm thinking also about my own story too, is like, there has to be a correlation to me struggling out here for a long time. You know, I slept in my, in the back seat of my car mm. for a few months, uh, you know, a whole summer out here in LA in a 92 Ford Taurus, Oof. you know, when I first started again, 12, 13 years ago. And, um, you know, there's something about going through that grind, not getting things too fast, mm. having a real appreciation that I think really helps. It helps what I, it, because here's here's the adverse to that right is like i think that if i was born in a great situation had a mm. big house with all the toys that i wanted and two parents that really loved each other and all this shit and then i got thrown into this and i got something too quick like mm. i don't see i i could see how those people end up really messing things up mm. i think anybody who gets anything too quick could really mess things up there's something too Especially, maybe it's especially in stand-up comedy too. I mean, there's a thing in this business where you don't really make it until you've gone through a lot. Mm. Bill Burr, you know, popped late. Louis C.K. popped late. At least, you know, in this YouTube age, you know what I mean? It's sort of a different thing. You can get it really fast now, huh? Or, well, I mean, I guess. But in the it's still in the real comedy world, it's different. You know, real mm. com it, comparing YouTube and real stand-up. You know, it's it's a different thing. But my point is, is sort of like, you know, those paying dues really help. Mm. It helps every day after that. Do you have any kind of disdain towards like a lot of the uh, Instagram comedy or the YouTube comedy stuff that, that is kind of passed off, that, that does well, that does numbers, but... From I mean, the perspective of a real comedian, it's just trash. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, not trash, trash, but, you know, it's one of those things to where sort of almost everything has already come out mm. of a comedian's mouth at some point. Right. You know, so I, I just, I haven't said, maybe it's just me. I don't watch a, a ton of YouTube. I don't watch a, a ton of content, period. But I haven't, you know, like I follow like World Star and mm. I think they're comedy, you know. I, a I, lot of I, times I, they'll repost stuff that's like right, comedy. Right. And it's so stupid. Right. <laughs> I, and the thing I love that they're doing now is just like basically the videos with all the freaks. Like I just love that shit. Yeah, long neck. We had yeah. we had long neck and wide neck on here. <laughs> wide neck is a fucking gangster, bro. Really? Oh my. What'd God. you guys do? Anything fun? We just talked, but I mean, the, the funniest part about interviewing long uh, wide neck to me was that I was asking, you know, did you get joked on? Did people bully you or make fun of you because of your fucking wide ass neck during your childhood and stuff? And his response to that was very much like, nah, right. ain't, ain't nobody fucking with me. Nobody, no, nobody gonna say shit to me because I know I'm gonna fuck him up, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And it was like, it was like he had never heard it before because he was just so, you know, he really grew up in like fucking rough ass part of uh, Pensacola, Florida, I guess, and has all kinds of charges for drugs. Do you ask him how his neck got like that? Like, is there a workout he does? Is there a way he <laughs> sleeps? Does he sleep like in the bridge position? Is holding him? I'm, I'm not sure he's owned it like enough to. I don't think he's working on developing okay. his his neck at all. But I I do think that that because that's that's one of his quotes. He was like, "It ain't no deformity." <laughs> <laughs> he actually said that. Ain't no deformity. Man. It must be something he does he's not telling us about. Hey, I want to show you this fucking girl that I uh, recently became Instagram friends with just because she saw me on my stream watching her or like looking at her Instagram. And um, she actually liked it enough that she followed me. And now we are great friends. But Get the fuck out of here. This is, I'm gonna, I'm All right, gonna, you're fucking with me. No, this is a real thing. She's Come gonna, on. She's tired. I like this girl, actually. Are you fuck. messing with me? I don't have the good fucking view. I guess I could put it like this. Yeah. So So she's owning the unibrow. Get the hell out of here. She doesn't give a fuck. Okay, wait. Is this... She is bad. Oh, my God. And she is owning the unibrow. I've actually... My girl is kind of conspiring that she thinks that this girl might actually, um, like, dye it or, like, she might have done something to accentuate it because my girl said that her unibrow, if she had never tweezed it would be something but nothing like this oh my god she looks like uh one of like the um god what is it it's like a little like 
Whoa. Are man. you down? No, too much for me, you man. You couldn't handle it. No, I couldn't handle it. I'll be honest with you. She's a pretty girl, huh. but... And she's a model, too. I'm yeah. not sure for who, but it says she's uh, signed to some my guess is she's premier an, models. My guess is she's an eyebrow model. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I don't know how you take a girl like that out to dinner and uh, be surprised when everybody's staring at your girl's mm. eyebrow. It would be fun to be her boyfriend because everywhere you'd go, you'd know that you're basically just like gearing up for a fight. But it'd be, it'd be so annoying. You'd have to answer the same fucking question all the time. Can you imagine how bigger Bush must be? She must be owning that too, I would assume. Imagine you get down there and she's got some manicured little landing strip. I'd be so bummed. This is so off brand. Yeah, no way. She's a, that fucking thing is chaos down there. Yeah. She's got a whole nother eyebrow right mm. above right above her butthole. It must be. It must be out of control. She's got a butt brow. Yeah. But so you couldn't do it, okay. Nah, it's too much for me. I don't know. So I might I might wake her up one morning just wax. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> New life starts today. <laughs> once you saw it, you probably couldn't unsee it. Like once you saw her without that, you'd probably never be able to be like, oh yeah, just just keep growing that up. Man, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What would you do with that? Would you kiss it? Would you start your first night with her? Would you give her one? Mm. Is that how you would At start At night, it? I would just rub it like a caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> the, the length of her face. <laughs> oh man. Why not? Wow. You never date as a girl with any kind of deformity? Deformity or any, uh, any special characteristic like that? I'm not sure what category to put it in. Ah, oh, special characteristic. Because if you don't, I'm gonna hit you with something. No, hit me with it. Okay, when I was 13, my first like real girlfriend uh, was missing fingers on one of her hands. I'm not sure. I think it was a birth defect, but like a bunch of her fingers were basically like one knuckle or like two knuckles, mm. and. Um, she was so good at hiding it. She'd always be jamming it in her pocket or sort of like twisting it up in her shirt or something. She was obviously super self-conscious about it. But to the point where some people in school that hadn't like known her since her childhood didn't even really know about it because she did such a good job hiding it. But yeah, I dated her for a period of time. And she's actually my first uh, hand job with the, the other hand. <laughs> the other hand? Yeah. She didn't use the fun one? No, no. She didn't give you the old penguin hand job? No, there was a lot of things that she could have pulled off if you really think about it. Like she could have jammed one of those little one knuckle things Heck in yeah. your urethra. And She's got of, a natural shocker on her right hand, ready to go, dude. Yeah. We didn't know about uh, the, the male G spot at that time. Otherwise, you could have, you know, sort of like eased your way. If she has all different finger lengths, then she could sort of ease her way into getting a finger in your ass. Absolutely. Yeah. Probably very easily. Hmm. Probably invited. <laughs> I heard that she became some kind of crazy kleptomaniac because my friend told me that he was at some college party where everybody had to take her, their shoes off and that somehow he, he had figured out that she stole the shoes. Whoa. Yeah. Damn, that's weird. It's weird to think that somebody out there knows what girl I'm talking about. There's got to be somebody I went to high school watching this right now. Oh, somebody's seen that hand before. Name and shame in the comments. I wonder how she's doing. Hmm. Hmm. Um, <laughs> so you're doing you doing some sets tonight? Yeah, at the comedy store tonight. Fun times tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. You ever been to the comedy store in London? Yep. I was standing I was, outside of it the other day. Yeah, I was yeah. just in it a few months ago. I didn't perform there, but uh, but it's a cool joint. That's just a few blocks away from the Soho Theater that does really fun shows. That's where I performed at. I saw the Book of Mormon across the street. Oh hell yeah! Yeah. That's that's a, that's oh that's another thing. That's I had a, never seen it. I didn't even know about it. Now now I feel stupid because I didn't know about it. Everybody how, seems like they know about it. How much did you love that? It was incredible. It's yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. Like that's I'll put that up there with Dark Side of the Moon. Like that's mm. something people, in my opinion, there's a few things out there that people need to absorb. Right. Art wise. Right. I think Book of Mormon's one of them. I wonder what that would be like if it came out today. Because it came out so long ago that it feels like the standards for what's considered offensive would have been so different at that time. And a lot of the shit with the fucking African people dancing around and whatever. I don't know if that could be put into action today. And it's interesting that it's still happening. But I think I think you know. I think it would. And I think it could. I think it, there's a beautiful science to making something undeniable. Mm. I think that's what that is. Right. I think that for as many things that make fun of, that that's what that piece of art really is. They're making fun of absolutely everybody. Mm. It's under the disguise of Book of Mormon, so you think they're gonna, you know, make fun of the African Mormon. people. Definitely are, are more 
with it. Even though they're like being accused of having AIDS and all this shit on in the play, it's very much like they're the ones who kind of get it, and these Mormon ones are the delusional ones. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's beautiful like that. It just makes sense. Not only did those guys not get in trouble for that, they won Tony Awards. We're right. talking about the South Park guys, right? Yeah, about a group of guys that if if Broadway, you know, didn't want to. You know what I mean? Why would they? I googled. It's crazy it. what happened there. I was trying to find um, examples. Like I, I googled like Book of Mormon controversy, and I could only find Mormons offended by it. I didn't see any black people offended and by, by it. And by the way, they weren't that offended. Like that must have been offset groups because mm. the actual Mormons bought programs in the thing. Like they rolled with it. Really? They rolled with it really good. I think they looked at it like great publicity mm. for them actually yeah actually it didn't really do much to point out the absurdity of being mormon so much as the absurdity of like these particular guys and the overall idea of going to other countries to try to convert them to your religion yeah yeah so good they could have gone a lot harder on the mormon people for sure yeah i mean that's Mm. just uh, religion that's so crazy (laughs) to me (laughs) it's unbelievable i went to a uh i went to a catholic school growing up how about you no, Nashua High and Penichuk Ella Junior High. Yeah, going really to a Catholic there. school messes you up, man. Really? Yeah, it changes your view on religion completely. You didn't get diddled, but you just saw a lot of fuck, fuck shit? Yeah, it just makes you anti-religion. Because like I said earlier, all my teachers were mean. They were mm. all just evil haters. Like bad, mean people. Not every single one of them. Mm. Like 94% of them. Okay. And so... They're trying to push this while doing that at the same time. It's just like, oh, this is, I can see. It's crazy because a lot of the people that I know that went to Catholic schools from wherever they're from uh, are the least Catholic people right. ever. Turns and them off. I think it really, it's, I, I think they, I think it, they think it's good marketing for them, but I don't think it's doing good once they realize like, oh, if our teachers are assholes, then we're showing these people that bad people are religious people Mm. and the people that aren't religious are the fun people and good people. Right. I grew up hating religion and Christianity so much, but to be honest, like the role of religion in the average American's life at this point, it feels like it's such an insignificant concern. And uh, like, even when, if you think about when like the, uh, all the big atheist artists or uh, authors started to emerge, like Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson or not Jordan Peterson, uh, fucking Richard Dawkins, all this shit, when they were putting all, all their atheist books and stuff, it almost feels like that time period, that sort of like revelation of the new atheists is like unnecessary in these times. Like it just doesn't really feel like anyone needs to fucking hear that message anymore. Yeah. I think people saying that they're atheist is giving too much credit to all the other religions. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, you're just saying that you're something that isn't religious. Just don't say anything at all. The weird part is just that that could be considered the default is that you should believe in this fucking weird book. Right. But it doesn't feel like that anymore. You don't meet people and assume they're religious. I think people are figuring out, like, you need to, you know, do something, right? Something meditative Mm. in your life. Yeah. Something that takes you away from everything. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to maybe get a little exercise, maybe eat a healthy snack. Whatever people used to be getting from religion, yeah, they're getting from yoga and, like, fucking berry shakes. 100%. $15 shakes hell yeah they're delicious too isn't that weird yeah yeah <laughs> all right i'm gonna uh, wrap this up because i do have another one that i have to do at seven and i gotta figure out food here at some point what it's not happening well fuck her something with her sister okay well whatever hopefully cam girl's family members survive oh shit did you say cam girl it's uh oh. this girl that works for me that's like her dj name oh she's not a cam girl actually not really that doesn't I'm, rarely have i seen anything that would indicate that she has any kind of sex life but hmm. i assume there's, there's probably something going on she has a boyfriend <laughs> i would assume there's got to be some kind of interaction probably maybe yeah anything you want to promote anything on the way uh yeah doing a lot of uh a lot of road shows uh doing stand-up comedy and kill tony's in philly pittsburgh uh, dallas texas uh again Mm. Uh, um, miami key west doing stand-up there in the next month and uh yeah let's check out kill tony on uh mondays at the comedy store live 8 p.m come by anytime sounds good i gotta start pulling up 
making some friends or something. Yeah, you got to come hang out anytime, man. It's a good environment. Hell Backstage, yeah. getting high as fuck with a bunch of funny ass people. Absolutely, anytime. You know the deal. Yeah, Chris, my my liaison. I love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tony Henchcliffe, No Jumper. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. Like, comment, and subscribe.